Well, okay, welcome back to our one o'clock keynote speaker well, presentation. <laughs> Today we're fortunate to have Angela Desjardins, who's a solar phys physicist by training. She's the director of the Montana Space Grant Consortium, director of Montana NASA EPSCOR, and the current chair of the NASA EPSCOR Caucus. Montana Space Grant and NASA EPSCOR are programs that work to strengthen education and research in Montana in fields related to aerospace science and engineering. Angela is proud to be a third generation Montanan who was able to follow her dreams of working for NASA while staying in Montana. Angela's mission is to use the ability of space to ignite the human sense of wonder, to engage Montana students, teachers, and researchers in aerospace activity, capitalizing in our, on our inherent uh, fascination with discovery and exploration to further the drive to achieve great strides in STEM fields to conduct research in solar astrophysics with an emphasis on student involvement and to cultivate a spirit of service. So without further ado, I give you uh, <coughs> Angela Desjardins. The title of her talk is The National Network of Total Solar Eclipse High Altitude Balloon Flights. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in. Thanks for the introduction, Ron. Um, so this is kind of a, a lengthy title and in my mind I've been kind of calling this the Edge of Space Eclipse Project or just the Eclipse Project for short. Um, so whatever uh, floats your boat more, um, feel free to refer to it as that. At this <coughs> point we might have some kind of official acronym but at this point we don't. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to go over um, some background information, which is going to involve some dancing and some physics. Um, and I know some of you out there are groaning right now because when I say dancing, I don't mean just me dancing. I mean you all dancing. Um, and then I'm going to go into um, talking about the big picture of the project. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the details that we are currently thinking about. None of these details are set in stone at this point, um, but things that we are considering um, and would love your input on. So uh, to start out, uh, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the history of total solar eclipses. Uh, so the first recorded history um, of total solar eclipses <coughs> is by the Chinese as far back as 2800 BC. Now the Chinese didn't make these observations in a scientific way, um, but they did record them and notice that there happened to be some kind of, um, that there might be some kind of pattern to the eclipses. Uh, the first actual scientific uh, observations of eclipses was done by Kepler in 1605. And a really interesting th thing happened with a total solar eclipse in 1868. So that was actually the first time any chemical element was actually discovered outside of the Earth. So during observations of that eclipse in the corona of the sun, they were actually able to detect a new element that they didn't know what it was, um, and it became known as helium for <laughs> for Helios, for the sun. And one that I find particularly interesting, uh, because I'm a physicist, is in 1919, um, Einstein's theory of general relativity was proven um, by the sun actually acting as a gravitational lens. Um, and that proved his theory of general relativity. All right, so enough history. This is uh, a, a STEM session, after all. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about physics for a while, because I think for us to really understand um, the true uh, unique attributes uh, or the uniqueness of a, a solar eclipse, we need to talk a little bit about the physics of the rarity of eclipses. And in order to talk about the, the physics of eclipses, we need to first have a general understanding of the geometry of what's going on. Um, and you all are a really uh, smart bunch of people who happen to be, you know, aerospace people or people working in STEM fields. So I know this activity might be um, easy for you, but um, I think it'll really help us put in perspective uh, the, the physics of what's going on. 
So um, you might have thought I was joking about the dancing, but I'm not. Um, so I'd actually like everybody to stand up. Um, and Burke, right here in the front row, is groaning at me right now. But uh, let's just go for it and, uh, and play my dancing game. So uh, I call this dance the um, Rotate Orbit Moon Dance. And so we're going to learn via what we call kinesthetic astronomy. So research has showed that uh, using your bodies to interact with how you learn things really helps you to cement that in your mind. Um, and I guarantee you after doing this, even though you already know these things we're going to do today, um, you'll probably remember the physics of our orientation better. So first we're going to start with uh, rotate. So which, so say, say we are Earth, um, think of your heads as Earth, and north is up. So like if you have the ecliptic plane or whatever, north is up. I want you to rotate the direction Earth rotates. Go. Some of you are rotating clockwise. Some of you are rotating counterclockwise. Which direction does Earth rotate? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, yes. OK, so that's the, the first part of the dance. Earth rotates to counterclockwise if north is up. Um, but right, Earth doesn't actually rotate with north straight up, right? It, or it rotates at what angle? 23 and a half degrees. Awesome. Um, so this is where the, the dance gets a little bit more embarrassing, okay? Um, so let's pretend um, for this uh, point of the exercise that north is like that direction, okay? And now we're going to involve a little bit of like yoga chair pose, if anybody knows yoga. So kind of squat down like this, right? And point yourself at about a, a 23 and a half degree angle and point that way. That's north. What star am I pointing at? Awesome. OK. So now, so now let's you know, do the dance, OK? Let's, let's rotate, always pointing 23 and a half degrees, OK? Job, everybody. Okay, good. Okay, so now now let's do the the season exercise. Okay, so say say our heads are in the northern hemisphere, and I pointed north, and the sun is on that wall. What season is it? Summer. Awesome. Okay. Now what if the what if the sun is behind us? Okay. What if it's over there? Fall or spring? Summer. Fall. It's fall. Counterclockwise. Fall. There you go. Yes, because Earth goes around the sun in what direction? Counterclockwise. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so now we got rotate and orbit down. Uh, now the next part is the moon. So. Uh, how long does it take the moon to, to orbit the Earth? One month? Hmm? 28 days. Yeah, there we go. Uh, which direction does moon orbit the, the moon orbit the Earth? Counterclockwise. Right. OK, so now let's say that uh, the sun is on that wall, and I am and we are Earth. And the moon is between the sun and the earth. What phase is the moon? New moon. New moon. OK, over here? Full moon. OK, awesome. So uh, just for the sake of the dance, before y'all sit down. <laughs> uh, so right, uh, the earth orbits or rotates once every 24 hours and goes around the sun once every 365 and a quarter days. Um, and the moon goes around the Earth uh, once every 28 days. So just assuming for the sake of simplicity that the sun is relatively stationary on that wall, um, everybody just try the rotate orbit moon dance. So you have to have the right angle, OK? And you have to have the moon. And on a time scale of I have to rotate once every 24 hours while the moon is going around once every 28 days. OK, ready? Go. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, good job. Thanks for participating. <laughs> now that you're all sufficiently dizzy, uh, the next, oops, backwards, uh, part of the geometry I want to talk about. So, obviously, uh, the moon is what phase during an eclipse? New moon. Uh -huh. But it turns out that uh, the plane of the moon orbiting the Earth is not perfectly parallel with the ecliptic. Right, so the ecliptic is the plane defined by the, the Earth and the Sun. Um, and it turns out the way that the moon orbits the Earth is actually tilted at five degrees, about five degrees. And so this means that at any given point in time, when the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, the chances are that it's not going to actually be at a node, right? Actually, on the line where the planes of the ecliptic and the moon's orbit actually intersect. So that's the main reason um, why eclipses are so rare. Um, and so you can actually see in this lower diagram here, this gives you an idea of scale. So if this were the scale of the Earth to the moon, and the Earth and the moon are those relative sizes, and this is a, they're at a five degree angle, this is the kind of distance that we're talking about to be at a node. It turns out that it's not just as simple as that. Um, not only is the orbit of the moon tilted at an angle, but it's also not perfectly circular, what orbit is, right? Um, and so it turns out that because of the elliptical nature of the orbit of the moon, the moon appears a different size to us depending on where it is on its orbit. So, for example, uh, the, the closest the moon gets to us is about 221,000 kilometers. And the farthest away from us that it gets is 253,000 kilometers. It turns out that the geometry of the system means that the penumbra of the shadow of the moon, so where you actually have the, the dark shadow of the moon, um, can extend no longer than 236,000 kilometers. And so oftentimes when um, the um, moon is at a node um, at the right place, it might actually be uh, too close to us. And in that particular case, it would create what's called an annular eclipse so that it doesn't totally block the disk of the sun. And of course, much more commonly, we get partial eclipses where we're out here in, um, in the penumbra. I'm sorry, this is the umbra. I misspoke. Um, in the penumbra, where you get just a, a partial eclipse. Um, so, so there you go. That's, that's why eclipses are, are so rare. Um, I keep going backwards. Um, so here's a map um, just to kind of show the, the rarity, especially when we're talking about um, the United States, which I'm you know, focusing on um, for this particular project. So this is the total solar eclipses from 1951 to 2000. And really, you could extend that to now. We haven't had any total solar eclipses in the United States um, between 2000 and now. And so you, you can see that um, the United States wasn't a particularly good place to see total solar eclipses in the last 60 or so years. Um, unless you happen to be in Montana, for example, uh, in February of 1979, then Montana was a really fantastic place to be. Um, so how many of you, raise your hand if you've seen a total solar eclipse in person? About half of you? Yeah. And so for those of you who have seen a total solar eclipse, uh, keep your hand raised if that really had a profound impact on you. It's something that you'll really never, ever forget. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that is probably true of most people, even people who aren't in the select audience of, of scientists and engineers. There's something about the sun being blocked out uh, 
that tends to really have an impact on people. Um, so, oh man, backwards. Um, but, but what about from space? How many of you guys until now have seen a picture of an eclipse, a total eclipse from space? You've seen a picture? Yeah. So it turns out that um, that's pretty rare too. To be in the right place at the right time is almost as difficult from space as it is on the ground. It's only happened about four times before. Um, so the Gemini 12 crew saw an eclipse from space in 1966. Um, this particular photo was taken from the International Space Station in 1990, or I mean, excuse me, in 2006. And then it was seen from the Russian Mir Space Station in 1996 as well. Um, and uh, this picture kind of brings me to the point that one of the things eclipse hunters really like to do is view the eclipse from some kind of vantage point where they can actually see the shadow of the moon coming across the earth. There is something that even speaks to you even more if you can actually get that sense of like the sh this foreboding shadow, you know, moving across the earth. Um, and there are actually no videos of eclipses from space, so we don't, you know, really get get a sense of that from space. But in fact, the the shadow of the eclipse moves at about a half a mile per second. So it, it's relatively you know, quick in a sense of a half a mile per, per second is quick, but um, even from space, it would be seen to kind of move relatively slowly. So if this uh, vantage point is particularly interesting to be able to, to see the shadow, um, one of the natural conclusions is right, what does it look like from the edge of space? Um, and has anybody, has anybody ever seen a picture of a total eclipse or a movie from the edge of space, from a balloon. Those of you who have seen my presentation before, of course. Um, so there's a, so it's been done once before. Um, it was done during the 2012 eclipse um, that happened in Australia. There was a team of Romanians and Australians that got together and decided that this would be a cool thing to do. Um, so indeed they did it, and they posted the video on YouTube, and um, if you just you know, Google 2012 Australia Total Eclipse Balloon, you'll find the whole video. Um, but I just took a, a short clip out of it to give you a sense of what they saw. So that happened to be looking away from the sun. If you watch the whole video, um, you'll actually see the balloon swing around, pointing the other direction, where you can actually see um, the sun, you know, eclipse instead of being the like crazy bright blinding thing in most of our images and videos. It's uh, nicely dark eclipsed. Okay, so so given that introduction about um, the excitement of eclipses and the vantage point of of near space. Um, I want to give you a second to look at this particular figure and, and tell me what it says to you. Montana 2044. <laughs> Montana 2044? Okay. What else does it tell you? There's a really great opportunity. Yeah, this is, you know, this eclipse in, in 2017. That's just the swath across the United States. And we have these ballooning programs all across the United States. Um, so I think, at least to me, when I uh, first, there was a, a tiny eclipse happening um, about six or seven months ago. And some people were looking at it from a plane and there was a story on NASA about how crazy it was, how hard it was for them to be in this plane at the right place at the right time to view this few seconds of totality in this eclipse. And I was like, why the heck would you want to do that from a, a plane? Like, why wouldn't you just sit in a boat in the ocean in the right place at the, at the right time? Um, and I started thinking about, oh, you know, you know, it is interesting maybe, you know, what could you learn about being at the edge of space? Not thinking about the, the shadow at all, I was just thinking about to be, you know, solar physics, what kind of things could you learn about the sun? Um, and then quickly realized that it's 
the, the shadow, that's almost more interesting than actually looking at the sun. And then I started to think about all of these mature ballooning programs across the country and what a prime opportunity this would be to have a huge network um, of balloon launches, flights all across the country as this was happening. Um, and not just to do that um, amongst ourselves, but to share that with the rest of the country so that there was an opportunity for people all across the country, even if they weren't in a place where they could view the total eclipse themselves, but they could see live images from the edge of space. Because chances are that the ISS is not going to be in the right place at the right time. I actually don't know for sure. I don't even know if NASA knows at this point. Um, but to be able to share with the public, you know, the physics, the science, the, the engineering um, involved in doing something like this. So the plan is to um, downlink live images, if not live video, from the edge of space as the eclipse marches across the country and put it on the NASA website um, for all to see and to learn. So um, let me start now to get into a little bit more details about um, the project. So why, you know, why would we want to make such an effort? Um, there's really a broad range of, of why, at least in my mind. And, and I wanted to start with this, but I forgot. So um, this is an idea that um, I'm kind of the main person pushing for, but I have a lot of people who are helping me. So, so add a bunch of heads to me as you're looking at me up here. <laughs> so Chris Kaler, um, the director of Colorado Space Grant, and Luke Flynn, the director of Hawaii Space Grant, are helping me on the national level, like inter interact with NASA to figure out a lot of these things. Um, Burke Knighton and Jen Fowler um, in Montana and Randy Larimer are helping me with a lot of the details, heading up all the different teams that we have. Um, and then basically I'm using the whole space grant and hopefully now ballooning network um, to build up the different teams to, to be leaders on actually making this project happen. So add all those heads as I'm, as I'm talking about this. Um, but the why in our mind is um, public engagement. So as I was just talking about the opportunity to share this really exciting event that's going to be really, I, I really think it's going to be, you know, an encompassing event as we get up to the eclipse that's going across the country. It's going to be a huge national um, opportunity to really reach people and get people excited about STEM fields. Um, it's a workforce development opportunity, so involving Right now, I have 47 states that have uh, signed up to do this project. So we don't really know how many teams yet, but um, you know, dozens of teams working together, all student-led, um, to do this highly collaborative, mission-like, multidisciplinary project. It's just fantastic workforce development opportunity. There's also some really interesting science um, and technology challenges that are possible with this, and I'll talk um, more about those um, in a minute. Um, and then there's a great opportunity for simple um, collaborations. Um, we hear all the time, increasingly, how important partnerships and collaborations are in today's age of waning budgets and things like that. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity, not only to partner with each other, um, but partner with other agencies. So. And Space Grant, we're you know, basically NASA, um, but we're also you know, talking about working especially with NSF, but maybe DOE and a couple other federal agencies, and also with our industry partners. Um, in particular, Google Loon is on the horizon, and some other technology companies that we might partner with. So that's kind of the big picture of, of why. And on my introductory slide, I kind of said, perfectly poised. Um, and I think one of the, the beauties about this project is that our ballooning programs across the country are mature enough that doing a project like this is not a, a huge endeavor. Like we have the capabilities now, or we're very close to the capabilities of, of doing this now. Like if we wanted to, the eclipse were next week and we wanted to 
fly payload, um, maybe not to do a live image, but to certainly take images, be in the right place at the right time, we could do it next week. And so the challenge is um, to maybe push the bounds of the technology of what we can do and to push the bounds on what kind of massive collaboration we could do. So it makes, we're just kind of in the perfect place. We're in the right, right place at the right time to make this happen. So there's a lot of words on this slide, but basically I just wanted to talk through our current timeline. Um, this might change slightly, and of course, you know, feedback is welcome, but um, right now um, we're planning on this next academic year continuing to organize, um, put our main teams together. Um, the, the very first team that was put in place was the, the payload design team. So we have a, a group of folks who are taking the lead on designing the, the common payload. So the idea is that each balloon will have at least two payloads. One payload, that's the common payload, that will be the communication and the downlink um, of the images to the, to the NASA website. And so we want all of those to be the same so that the interface that NASA will receive to upload the live images will be common as the eclipse is marching across and there won't be any issues with different you know, types of data coming in and in, in different ways. But um, we're you know, fairly confident that that um, payload will be plenty small enough that there'll be room for a secondary payload of the team's choice, um, whatever type of payload they want to do. And the idea is that on the website, you know, we'll have the live images and everything, but we'll also have links to everyone else's um, secondary payloads um, that they can learn all about all of the other science and engineering that's going on um, with other, other payloads. So um, anyway, back to the timeline. So organizing, um, developing, the team is developing this, this common payload. Um, and the idea is that um, the, the common payload, well, it'll be kind of designed by this team. It'll be a kit. Um, so they'll have all of the parts and pieces figured out um, and a set of instructions. And then by December of 2015, um, for all the participating teams, they will deliver that kit. And then all the teams will have the next, uh, you know, half a year, six months, something like that. Um, to put the, the primary payload together um, and do as much testing or whatever that they can. In 20, summer 2016, we'll have a series of, of virtual or regional workshops where people will have a chance to um, get together and, and do some testing on their common payloads um, if they're having issues to work with the designers. Um, so James Flatten is on that team and Burke is on that team. Um, to troubleshoot if they're having any issues, um, and to just run through um, different things to make sure that those payloads are working well, and then make a punch list of if issues that might have come up. Um, and then the academic year following that, um, this is where the developing of the secondary payloads will be key, making sure all those secondary payloads are um, ready to go and tested. Um, and then in summer 2017, this is when it all happens. Um, so we'll do a full-scale dry run in June. So um, we'll actually have at least one balloon launch from every launch location that will happen in August. Um, and do the whole interface with NASA up to the, the website and just practice the whole thing and make sure that we're ready to go. And then the actual eclipse is August 21st, 2017. Um, it starts about 1.20 Eastern time on the coast of Oregon. Well, it actually starts out in the ocean, but as far as the US is concerned, it starts on the coast of Oregon about 1.20 um, PM and finishes an hour and a half later on um, the coast of South Carolina. And then to, to sum up everything um, that the students have learned, um, we'll have a national meeting, um, a themed national space grant meeting um, that all the participants, even if they're not space grant supported, will be invited to to present their results. So you're all probably wondering, okay, you know, how much is this thing going to cost? And I think um, this is part, at least for me, of the being well poised, um, because I believe um, these very rough, rough estimate costs that we have here are really quite reasonable. 
Um, and so you can kind of see here, we've kind of estimated what the different um, aspects would cost. And this is mainly very location dependent. Um, like one of our very excited participants um, is Alaska Space Grant. Um, so in order for them to participate, they're, they're probably gonna either come to where we're gonna launch in Idaho or they'll launch with Wyoming. But for them to, to come down and participate in that, um, there's a lot of travel costs. So the main difference in this range here of $6,000 to $25,000 has mostly to do with the travel cost if you're not on the eclipse path versus being on the eclipse path. And one note that I want to make here is that um, we uh, want to be very open to all kinds of different possibilities. So say for example, I mean this is probably not you guys, but say for example you're from a state that really wants to participate, but you don't have an active ballooning program, um, then you're welcome to build a payload and talk to someone who does know how to do the launch part of it and get your payload on their balloon. Um, so open to all those kind of things. Or maybe you want to just be a launch provider and you don't actually want to build a secondary payload. We're open to, to all of those options. So I mentioned before about the planning team. So these are the teams that we have in place right now. Um, there might be a possibility of having further teams, but um, at this point, this is what we um, have and foresee. So as I said, we already have a um, primary payload um, kit um, you know, design team. Um, where I'm currently putting the, the finishing people on the launch sites team. Um, so this is the team that uh, there's going to be like a, a point person for every launch site. And this person is most likely going to not only have to be in charge of either themselves or appointing someone to do all the, um, the flight predictions and all that kind of stuff associated with their particular site. But they're probably also going to have to host other teams um, because there's going to be other teams coming to their location to launch balloons. Um, and then I have the participating teams team. <laughs> and this team is the one who will help us uh, sign everybody up, basically, and define what it means to, to sign up. Um, and then finally, uh, a science team. This is the least well-defined team. But uh, as a solar physicist, I actually know that there's a lot of people in the solar physics community who are very interested in um, what kind of science that you can do um, during the eclipse. And us being above 99.5% of the atmosphere provides some other interesting opportunities. Um, and so I think it'd be fantastic to have a team who is really focusing on science and you'll see a particular idea um, that I have there. So a little bit more about the, the primary payload kit. Um, it's just con conglomeration of different ideas. Um, we're pretty sure we want to do satellite tracking. Um, we're, we're settled on that, that being important. Um, and of course, we have this whole how we're going to interface with the NASA website. So I have the picture of uh, Scott's system up here um, as just an example. Again, we're totally in the planning stages. Um, we don't have anything solidified for exactly how we're going to do this, but um, we need to have a, a really good web interface for all the information to be there, and we need to have very reliable tracking. Um, OK, so this is a little bit of a technical slide, but um, you might be interested to know, like, how long does totality last in the different places of the country or in the different parts of the eclipse path? So I put this slide together. Um, and the really, you know, the very positive thing to notice first is so the greatest duration is here, this little purple balloon. And it lasts, the totality lasts for about 2 minutes and 40 seconds at the greatest duration. But even you know, way over in Oregon, um, the duration of totality is two minutes at the center of the eclipse path. So when you start to deviate, uh, in this particular case, north or south of the eclipse path, or the center of the path, that's where you start to lose time. So for example, so this is about the location that we're maybe going to launch from in Idaho. And to give you an example, the, the totality at the center of the path is 2 minutes and 17 seconds, and, but the totality at the edge is only 25 seconds. 
Um, so, so being, if you want longer duration of totality, you want to be cl as close to that center line as possible. Which kind of leads to the next slide here, and that is being in the right place at the right time. Um, so as many of you know, and we've already talked about, um, flight predictions are particularly key. So I'm really excited to hear that everybody is, is really working on that. Um, and I just threw out an example here that, that Burke gave me from a, a flight that um, prediction that he did. Um, so um, the green line here is the, the predicted path for this particular flight. And the blue bars here are about 50 miles apart. So the eclipse path is about 50 miles wide. So I kind of just threw that scale on the top of this flight prediction to give you an idea. So the eclipse path is about 50 miles wide. Um, and so say you want to be at the center, right? So with the flight prediction that Burke did, which is really very good, um, you know, we would want to be in this window. So this is about 75,000 feet is about where I drew the edge of this box, um, both going up and going down. So, you know, I'm assuming that we want to be above about 75,000 feet to get really, you know, really good pictures of the eclipse. So this is kind of the zone we want to be in during that two minutes. Um, and you can see here the actual um, flight path is in red. Um, and you can see that if this were the eclipse path and you want to be about the center at the right place at the right time, this prediction would have worked well. Um, but you can see that uh, if your prediction were more off than that, you might start to run into problems. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's key to have those predictions worked out. Um, and there's actually you know, some software that I think would be fantastic for teams to use where you can actually go back in time, right? Um, and I'm spacing the name of the, what's the name of the guy from NOAA that's Alan Jordan, um, who has the, the software out there where you can actually get historical data um, and, and run predictions based on the historical data. So for people who are wanting to launch balloons, um, to go back and get from previous August 21st data for their location and, and practice that, I think it would be really fantastic. Um, because the more practice we can do with those predictions at the time of year for that location, the better we can get at making sure we'll be in the right place at the right time. Um, and along with that, um, you know, one of the ways we can help be in the right place at the right time is start thinking more about these long duration flights. So I just have kind of a picture here of, um, of our first long duration flight um, that we did. And you can just maybe kind of see from the slope here. So this is the ascent rate. And you can just kind of draw an imaginary line if we didn't open the valve there. Um, the slope continuing up and where burst would have happened, we would have ended up with maybe about uh, you know, a half to two thirds of the amount of time that we did. Um, and this green bar, I don't know if you can see it really well, um, two minutes would actually be skinnier than that. Um, but if we have long duration flights, that just um, helps us to be in the right place at the right time. So I think that's a, a good thing to think about. Um, I don't think that you know, every um, payload, at least at this point, that flies during the eclipse has to be equipped to do a long duration flight. Um, I think it might be a really good idea, but um, I don't think it's a necessity at this point. We're still figuring that out. OK, so live images. Um, right now, um, you heard, well, you heard Scott in his presentation um, tell you that the image that he sent back that was, what, three, 320 by 240 pixels um, would cost $20 to, to send down. Um, and so you can imagine if you want a little bit better picture than that, um, the, the price is going to go up. Um, and the amount of time that it's going to take you to send that image back down is going to go up. Um, and things get, get complicated quickly. Um, but you know, uh, it's been done before. Um, Columbia Scientific, or the, the NASA Balloon um, Program Office, 
has sent back with a serial camera a picture, um, and hopefully we will, um, at Borealis, do that this summer as well um, and this fall. So I think basically we're at that point now where we can send down images, you know, pretty good quality images where you can definitely get a sense of what's going on. But the next question is, what about sending down live video? If we really wanted to push the bounds of technology and actually think about sending down live video, which I think would be fantastic, um, we have to start thinking really hard about bandwidth and about cost. <coughs> And so there's a lot of talk amongst the, the design planning team about, um, you know, do we do this in an analog fashion? Do we do it in a digital fashion? And there's pluses and minuses to both. And, um, you know, hey, can we get somebody to, to donate us the time? If we partner with Google Loon, will they just give us their system? You know, we'll, you know there's all this kind of talk about um, how we might be able to do that. Um, so kind of the current thinking about this is that we might have one or two balloons that are doing live video, and everyone else is doing live images. And then the teams will recover their payloads as quickly as they can when they get to ground, and then they'll upload the live, or they'll upload the high definition video online as quickly as they can. So that's kind of the, the like, we know we can do this kind of plan. Um, and of course, if something turns up that we're able to do live video on, on every balloon, great. Um, but it's a pretty significant challenge to do that. OK, um, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, but I want to talk a little bit about science first. Um, so I'm a solar physicist, and so this part gets me pretty excited. Um, but the thing that gets me maybe the most excited doesn't have to do with solar physics at all but it's science. And that, that's this quote right here. So, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna read it to you because I think it's pretty profound. So, due to the difficulty in making reliable and timely four-dimensional observations of atmospheric temperature in the vicinity of the path of the total eclipse, direct measurements of temperature changes in the troposphere to the stratosphere during a total solar eclipse still haven't been reported before. So, if we're doing this huge, you know, you know, 50 balloons or more um, across the country during a total solar eclipse. Man, we could report some really fantastic data about the temperature of the atmosphere during a total solar eclipse as it changes um, from the shadow to the light. I think that would be really cool. Um, There's some other really interesting things you can do looking at the sun. Um, so. Um, a big part of, of solar physics has to do with coronal mass ejections, when the sun has these explosions and it spews stuff out, and when it spews it towards Earth, it can have all kinds of effects. Um, in order to view those, we have to do you know, man-made coronagraphs, um, so block out the sun so we can see the faint light of the corona. Um, but of course, during the eclipse, we have a natural coronagraph, and we're gonna be up at the edge of space, which means we can make observations in, in ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, and the infrared, um, and a whole other wealth of, of information that we can get, um, in addition to what they'll be doing on the ground with visible light and, and other things like that. Okay, so um, signing up the next steps. Um, so in the next academic year, we're gonna do the process of signing up and becoming an official team. Um, and the reason we kind of want to have this done in the next year is because um, we are making a, a significant effort at this time to get NASA or NASA and NSF to pay for all of the primary payloads. And so we're hoping that is the case. And so we, we need to get an idea of how many teams are actually going to participate in this project so that we know how many payloads we need to have purchased for us. I'm just going to say it in the positive tone. Um, and then again, those will be delivered in December 2015. And so the, the participating teams team is going to define how all of that like official registering of teams is going to happen and um, delivery of the kit for the primary payload. Um, and as I said, we're in the process of getting funding for those. Um, 
there's going to be a high level of partnering with other teams and working out this process. There's going to be a lot of, of working with each other, a lot of you know, video conferencing and telecons and practicing. Um, and then again, in progress is working out other partnerships with other federal agencies and, and industry. And please let me know um, if you're interested in being in one of those organizing teams that I mentioned, so the, the payload design team, the launch sites team, particip participating teams team, <laughs> the science team. Um, and I just wanted to quickly mention the, the meeting that I was talking about. So, um, of course, we want to tell the world the results of this. So that'll be at the National Space Grant meeting um, in Hawaii, which sucks, I know. Everyone's going to hate that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll have a themed meeting with the all the presentations, student presentations of results, and we'll have um, invited talk by solar physicists, and we'll actually get tours of the solar telescopes there. Okay, so don't forget August 21st, 2017, that's the date. Um, and watch for updates as we go forward. Um, and if you want to, I have a, a big long list of people who want to be kept in contact with all of our updates as we go on. Um, so let me know if you want to be on that contact list. Let me know if you want to be on one of the organizing teams. Um, and we'll go from there. All right. Questions, comments, suggestions, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, since data is so expensive, why would we use, or why wouldn't we use uh, more of an amateur radio solution? Uh, something like FPV that's being used on a lot of uh, model aircraft right now, or uh, slow scan television. Yep. Yep. Those are things we're thinking about. Definitely. Yeah. But the the issue with those is um, the inability to do high definition. If we wanted to. Um, and, and some other things, but. Uh, I've seen yeah. FPV systems that'll do high definition. I don't claim that I own any of them, but I've seen them. Uh -huh. uh, just as something to keep in mind as well. Yeah. The range is very short, right? It, it's a little bit limited, um, but yeah. if, if we get the right equipment, we should be able to do it for less than the $500 it was to do uh, data, I believe. It, it really depends. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is, is a lot of those are actually sharing with amateur radio frequencies. They have the bandwidth. Uh, if you have an amateur radio ticket, then you can also up the power uh, as well, too. But of course, then that you're going to trade that cost with power budgets and stuff like that. And yeah, power is an issue. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Gotta love engineering. It's all about trade offs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Angela, could you clarify the images that we're thinking about here for the primary kit? Are they images of the eclipse of the sun or are they images of the shadow on the surface? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't play this video for you because I forgot. Um, so this, this video of the, um, that was taken during the Australian eclipse, you know, was pointing kind of at the horizon. And, and the video is actually very interesting if you watch the whole eight minutes of it, because you can see, you know, the shadow kind of come across and things like that. But due kind of to the, the quality of the video, and I don't know if their original video was higher quality than what was put up on YouTube. I'm guessing it probably was, because it was done from a GoPro. Um, but it looks kind of fuzzy or whatever. Um, and so I, um, you know, have this little video from um, our float from the, the April flight, um, just to kind of think about, you know, different angles. And we recently on our, on our flight um, from just last week um, had a, a serial camera pointed straight down. And it was, it was really interesting, but it had a pretty narrow field of view. So I think there's a lot of trade-offs. I think it would be great to have a variety, you know, some pointing at the horizon. I mean, maybe the payload has six cameras on it, and uh, you know, one's pointing at the horizon, one pointing down, and you take different stills at different times depending on where the shadow is. Or, um, yeah, I, I, I think um, it's going to be very interesting to look in different places at different times or different teams might want to have a secondary payload that's just staring at the sun. There's a lot of discussion about, 
you know, pointing and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, as you may recall, a month and a half ago, I asked Charles Kinkelberg about suggestions for uh, solar science on platforms like this. And you might recall the first thing out of his mouth was, well, because you're limited to 12 pounds, that really is going to be a, a, a big limitation for you. Yep. And then the only, only other thing he could suggest after that was some sort of uh, maybe polarization wheel. It's kind of spinning and you're checking different polarizations. Uh, I'm just wondering if your team will have other suggestions for, for science that could be done on obviously a, a payload that's limited to 12 pounds or smaller. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely working on it, and I invite you know everybody to work on it and think about it. I think it would be absolutely fantastic if we could contribute some science as well. Um, you know, and, and picking Charles' brain for Charles Kinkelberg um, at MSU is a kind of a unique individual because he's a, a solar physicist and observer, but he also has built several payloads. So he has a unique you know mind about um, what it takes to build a payload and the science that can be done. Um, and the, the first thing he said when one of our students went um, and talked to him was temperature. Yeah. I think that's uh, the temperature of the atmosphere is a biggie. Um, and then, of course, you know, the UV and EUV images are, are interesting as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of coupled with that, I mean, what what kind of captured my attention is, you know, at first it's kind of like unique one-time event, you know, so okay, to be a part of that. But I'm not sure that that's, to me, the impact potentially could be much bigger, much greater than that, and I can't I'm beginning to just think about that. But one thing would be, could one potential impact be what collectively can be done that would impact science that we've never thought of before or we never thought could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good, so I mean, being able to focus, so maybe the science team may be really key to this, to make this impact not just a one-time event, and, and maybe a demonstration of um, fundamental science right. could be impacted by collectively a lot. So it's not just the top scientists in the world that will make the great discoveries, but it would be collectively many scientists, and even you know, even even um, K twelve yeah. participation could be involved. And I'll actually give you one example. Now I think about it. Um, many of you have maybe encountered very high, what we call turbulence, at the very high altitudes. How many have seen that? Okay. Um, when Taylor first saw that. Um, we were surprised, um, but started looking in the literature and saw that other people had reported this. And as we started looking further, the literature seemed to be, well, those, they didn't really believe it. But we had videos of it, you know, we could show it. And so what, um, what Hank Boss did, he actually went to a conference that was a DOD conference. And I don't remember the specifics of it, but there were, you know, four-star generals and those types of people. And they were extremely interested in it and um, engaged a lot, and from what Hank Boss found out was that they had encountered things, <laughs> weird things that happened at those altitudes that they couldn't explain. So evidently they are thinking that this could explain it. Now this information came from a Gen Gen general education chemistry class at Taylor University, were the ones that were doing this. Um, in fact, I was disappointed, I was teaching the class. We lost everything because it was so violent that you know they sheared off all of the antennas and we lost data. We actually lost the balloon, we couldn't find it. It was only after quite a while we recovered it and we were able to look at video. So I was thinking, I tell my students this, so even a gen ed chemistry class could have the potential of having you know pretty significant scientific discovery. So I'm actually wondering something like that, that collect because we're collectively doing something to make some impact that could be really really different, really, you know, so it's kind of like, yeah, even, you don't have to be the top scientist in the world in an area 
to make some profound impact. So I, I don't know. I'm just wondering what kind of impact like that can be made as a result of this. Yeah. And, and just real quick before I get to the other questions, I just wanted to point out, too, this date is 2024, right? So that's only seven years um, after this one. And so, you know, if we develop the capability and the payloads, then there's a real possibility those could be reused during the next eclipse. Yeah, James? Well, just to follow up of what Ellen was saying, it seems to me that in addition to primary payload, which you are conceiving of as photographic payload, maybe it would be appropriate to say, and we're going to put in some con some uniform science payload also. Yeah. You can also put on their own secondary payload, but maybe that primary payload should think a little bigger. Sure. That sounds great to me. Yeah. Uh, if teams want to join, where should we be watching to get that application? Um, you know, it would be great first for you, for the, the, the main person at your location um, to get on my contact list. And so if that person just, you know, um, sends me their email and I have lots of cards with me, um, then um, that's, that's really the, the best way at this point. But when, when it does go live, we'll be sending it like, you know, to all the communities that we can think of when the registration site goes live. So, uh, talking from the SBA, uh, this, this looks really cool. What can we do to help? I mean, is there anything else that we can offer as far as resources from our membership or anything like that? Um, you know, right now, I think, you know, the thing I think of mostly is communication. Um, so, communicating about the opportunities, and I think that's because we're mostly in the organizational stage right now. Um, but for all of the people who are planning to, you know, to have that in the back of their minds that um, there's that additional resource there, I think will be really great. Maybe other things will come up that might be a logical thing for the association to do. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just let me know. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, let's thank our speaker.